Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of Vintage Racers Roundtable. My name is Ken Minot and the president of the Maine Vintage Race Car Association. And it's a pleasure to have you back. It's been a little bit while, but we are back finally for, I guess we could call this season two of the Vintage Racers Roundtable. So on behalf of MBRCA, we want to welcome you guys. Uh, this is the next installment in a series of programs that we do. We gather together some legendary figures in auto racing and motorsports here in the state of Maine and uh, take a look back in the rearview mirror of their legendary careers, trade some stories, get some truths, maybe a few, a few embellishments from time to time, but we always have fun doing this and we appreciate you guys being here with us. Uh, we're back at the studios of LCTV once again. We want to thank Larry and the whole crew here for their hospitality. And uh, once again, we've gathered together three more legends here today, but I can't go any further without introducing this legend right here, <laughs> my legendary co-host, Mr. Pete Silva. Uh, Pete's a member of the Maine Motorsports Hall of Fame class of 2016, uh, the New England Auto Racers Hall of Fame class of 2018. And Pete, it's been a little bit of a while, but welcome back. Good to be back. I uh, didn't mind a little break, but I've kind of been missing it since then. And yeah. uh, we've got three Totally different kind of characters this time. Yeah, I don't think we'll be too short on stories today. No, I don't know. Yeah, they probably won't. I don't think they've ever been accused of being shy. <laughs> Bob Bailey, who's done a little bit of everything, motor building, did a lot of, you must have done the setting up and everything of the cars you had. Yep, we did everything. Him and his, his uh, father-in-law, Louis Stewart, are very well known in Maine, New England racing. From here to Martinsville, actually, they've helped a lot of people get going not yeah, just themselves they've helped a lot of people in yeah this and state. speaking of Maine Motorsports Hall of Fame yes. uh, Bob one of our most recent inductees yeah. in 2019 and uh, next to him the legend himself probably one of the most popular and polarizing and uh, <laughs> is that the right way to put it Mr. Jeez. Bill Penfold you're being yeah. awful nice to him yeah I know <laughs> I, I like to be a little on the wild side. Yes, we've heard, we've heard that before. We'll get into a whole bunch of good stuff with you. And uh, we couldn't do this show without this guy sitting across the table from me. No, I couldn't. I wouldn't even think about doing it, to tell you the truth. Ken Lane has been instrumental in every show that we've done. He's tirelessly has got the information. We've had three people on every show. And he's got that information through the archives of every newspaper in the state of Maine, plus reaching out to the individuals themselves. So we owe you a debt of gratitude, buddy, going forward. So thank you. It's been a great opportunity. I really well, enjoyed it. It certainly worked for us, believe me, and it continues to work. So thank Ken sitting in for Bobby Harrison today that couldn't make it. Unfortunately, we were looking forward to having Bobby. He, his history, God, his history starts from the time he was in high school and athletics right on to racing. His whole fa There's been a Harrison and yeah. racing, I think, in Maine. One of the most legendary yeah. Maine racing families. So, yeah. got, I, I've known these two guys for a while. I'm just getting to know Bobby. And the thing that impressed me the most is he'd worked for Billy Penfold for 10 years and he still seems normal. <laughs> 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 and, and he's got a distinction of having been the last champion yes. when, when Beatridge was clay. So he's, he's had his hands in that so, place a long time. And, great yeah. history. Him and his brother Ricky did a lot, too, together. Yeah. Ricky Harrison. Yeah. So, so maybe, maybe there'll be a chance to get him on in another show. I talked, you know, we talked about the Alexanders as a family, if we can get them on and they can find time. And I think the Harrison deal would go. Uh, Bobby, Ricky, and, and they've got a nephew there, Michael. There's yep. plenty of Harrisons to... Yep. the research yeah right. absolutely and and before we get into this show like i said this is almost feeling like kicking off season two and i agree i think a good thing to do maybe to start is to look back at season one and how this all came about you and i kicked around some ideas yeah um we talked to vanessa jordan from wiscasset a little bit and and then we threw this idea to the guys here at Lincoln County TV, and a year ago, a little more than a year ago, we were we found ourselves up at Owl's Head Transportation Museum. We were at the January show, uh, Steve Perry's Northeast Motorsports show, mm -hmm. and I mentioned it to you. You just kind of taken over recently of being the club president, and I remember your exact words. You said, "I like that idea. I'll bring it up at the next club meeting." And you must have said something to Vanessa, and 20 minutes later, she came up to where I was standing with Tim Bennett's Bush X car, and uh, she said, Ken told me what you wanted to do, I love it. And her exact words were, and it blew me away, she says, let me make that a reality for you. Yep. And Chris, I think I blinked twice and we were in Lincoln County TV off <laughs> in this room and yep. off and running. 
Pretty yeah. impressive. And, and right out of the gate with three of the most legendary uh, racers to, to come out of this state. Yeah, uh, Fuzzy Holden, Norris Ouellette, and Dana Graves. What a great way to start. Yeah, and, and at, at Owl's Head Transportation yeah. Museum. With Jimmy Spence's uh, bush car sitting in the background right yeah. behind us. That was pretty cool. Yeah. But uh, yeah. Some, some really good stories from back in the 50s, 60s with those guys. Yes. I mean, back in the day, yep. you know, and, and uh, I was just overly impressed. I, I, first of all, I think the thing that made it work for us, and just like the Unity reunion is, we reached out to people that you just don't normally see talking in public, mm -hmm. and they all agreed to do it. That was probably, to me, the resonated with me the most, and I think that was a good way to launch with people that nobody's really heard the backstory. They've read about them, yeah. and if they knew anything about their racing, it was at the racetrack that night, and that didn't happen until the 70s, where they had a microphone on the racetrack. Right. Where you could, but it, it was just about that night, and we got to hear the backstory, and just like with these guys eventually, why and what made you do what you're doing. Yeah. But those guys were a great launch, and their history was way stronger than I, I, I knew they were great, Yeah. But until you see it accumulated on in one group, it was amazing. You couldn't yeah. have picked three better people. Yeah. And then we get into Larry Pottle, Bob Halley, uh, yeah. and, and Steve and Nelson, Mr. Yeah. Ten Time. What yeah. a great follow-up. And I mean, Pottle's, yeah. he's usually pretty quiet, and Bob, and Pottle yeah. started out just, where everybody was calling me when I got home and said, what'd you do with a Pottle? I never heard yeah. him talk that much. And, and I think that's kind of a, a testament to the format. You know, yeah, rather than, sometimes it's tough for a guy to sit one-on-one -on -one and come up with these things. But when we put three guys together that have something in common, all of a sudden that's where you start pulling out these stories. Yeah, the key part is what you said. They had something in common. And it was just like when we would do you three guys, you all worked together on Bush, you know, you and, and, and Billy and Bobby on Billy's Bush deal. But they had something in common. Yeah. And they had ex decades of experience around each other. Yeah. And we've yeah. had several other good shows. I think we've done 13 up till now. Yeah. Uh, another highlight was getting Chummy Brown in the house. Oh, my um, God. You want to hear some great stories. Everybody, all we heard for leading up to that is how Chummy probably get on there and wouldn't talk. Yeah. Boy, they missed that one by a mile. Yeah. And his stories. Yeah. The wedding story. Yeah. Yeah. Just all of that fun stuff. Uh, Dick McCabe was here, and uh, and and that brings back the the thought of why we do these shows to save these stories. Unfortunately, we lost Dave Staples now too long ago, and it was shortly after he did this show. Yeah, I can remember McCabe call, Dick calling and saying he was so thankful that we did the show and, and, and included uh, David Staples. David was a great historian too. And, and just a good person, supported everybody. I mean, obviously, he was a Dick McCabe supporter, but he just supported racing in general. But yeah. you're exactly right. That's why we, the object of doing the show, to get that life story before it's too late. Yeah. And then finally, our last show that we did was up at Augusta and uh, wow. had a live studio audience in that one. I know, Bill, you were there. Yeah. Uh, big Ken was there. Yeah, Ken yeah. was there as well um, with uh, three legends of uh, the Bush North. What a great, no, no, once again, three people with a lot in common. Yeah. You know, I knew that uh, Andy and, and, and uh, Brad, Joe Brad Hussey. had a lot of racing experience. I knew that Andy had driven at one time when he didn't have a lot going on for Andy. I mean, uh, Joe. But I didn't realize they won back-to-back -back Bush Grand National Championships together. Mm -hmm. That blew my mind. And, yeah. and the way it started, it went on is Andy needed a place to work on his car, and Joe let him work out of the garage. Yeah. And... And he didn't have any backing and told, asked Joe to drive the car. Yeah. Joe said, well, my wife doesn't want me to drive, so you got to drive the car. <laughs> but, I mean, it, it just... Yeah. And that was fun having a studio audience, too. Yeah. So, but, uh, oh, so here, here we are, uh, beginning of the uh, 2024 season, and uh, let's get into these guys here and uh, find out some history. And I want to start off how we start every show. So, Bob, you're the closest to me, so let's get and a little back. Yeah, and the oldest. oldest. I, I didn't want to say the that. But, um, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll take the part as the young one here. Uh, <laughs> Jesus. Uh, <laughs> hey, I take it's it when I get true, it. actually. Yeah. So really anyway, Bob, what, what got you into motorsports? I know you took a short swing at driving yourself, but uh, like some, you, you wised up pretty quickly and figured your part in this sport might not be behind the wheel. Well, that was just... A substitute for a, my brother-in-law had a 
in a street stock it was a old big old Pontiac Bonneville they were just running in a street stock and Earl Jones's son Scott was driving the car and he had two weeks that he couldn't come because he had a ball game to be at mm -hmm. and so I said well what the heck I'll drive it the first race I had a flat tire and the second race Where I ended this? up this was it was Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Yeah. Yep. And in the second race, I ended up winning the race, which that ended my career right there. And my wife still has the trophy. And well, she wasn't my wife at the time, but. But you figured go out on top? Yep. I quit while I was ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Unlike some people. A seven-day yeah. career? That, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> so. but, but had you always been a gearhead before that? Well, yeah. I'm, I mean, since I was a little kid, I used to, you know, my neighbor had a junkyard, and we used to tear stuff apart and build it. And then... Mm -hmm. Then I was working with a guy that he uh, used to go to Oxford on Saturday nights, and I don't know if you ever knew the guy, but his name was Floyd Weber. And I've, I've heard that. They name called him the Lisbon Lion, and so the guy's like, "I'd never been in the pit. I'd been in the grandstand." And he's like, "Oh, you should come up and go in the pit with me, and this and that." So I started going up there, and then that would have been probably in around '68ish, and then. I went to work for, which eventually became my father-in-law, mm -hmm. and um, so I was there one day, and I'm like, did you ever think about getting a race car? I, I'm not going to get a race car. Everybody I know that gets one of those goes broke, and the same old story, you know? Yeah. So next thing I know, not very far in the future, I don't remember who told me, but somebody says, oh, I see uh, Louie bought a race car. I'm like, a what? And he's like, <laughs> so he bought... It was a Ford Fairlane that Earl Jones was driving. It was his own car. Yeah. So my father-in-law bought the car from Earl. So I knew they were going to race it at Wiscasset. So I went down there and I had my video camera. And I took a picture of this car going around the track in the race. And it, something happened. It got, they got in a wreck or something, got hit, and couldn't go any further because it hit the radiator. Yeah. And as far as I know, that's still the only existing tape of that first car hmm. that wow. he bought. Yeah. And then it was all downhill from there because yeah. then we got involved. We bought a Ford Mustang from Harvey Sprague. Mm -hmm. and we the ran Fastback? The Fastback. Really? And, yeah. I, I know you, in here it said you bought your first car from uh, Harvey Sprague. You explained a lot there. I didn't know whether, because I know Earl Jones was around you right. a lot. So that started with his nephew or grandson or something? As far as the... Well, your relationship with Earl, the car you drove, who was supposed to drive it? No, the, the car I drove was a street stock, which, belong, which Earl Jones's son, Scott, was driving. But that's where the connection started. Yeah, and, yeah. But, but that was after the fact that my father-in-law bought oh. the Ford Fairlane. He bought out Earl Jones is what he did. Mm -hmm. Then Earl became our driver yeah. for quite a while. Yeah. And then eventually, down the road, we, like I say, not very long after that, bought the Mustang from Harvey and we ran that some and then we started getting into you know custom built chassis and yeah, that kind of stuff. I want to talk about yeah. so that okay I, I, I just didn't understand where all those cars came from I, right. I didn't know if you built them or bought them and yeah, uh, no. like I said by the time I met you you were f full swing right you know but right. Earl's a good guy yeah I used to run into him and Wally Patrick. They'd always come to Martinsville, and we'd meet him after up by the railroad tracks yeah. in that camper for a few beers. And, and you had mentioned your father-in-law, Louis, yeah. and, and people may, may or not, may not know, but Louis Stewart, another character from the, right. from the sport, for sure. Well, of course, at the time, we had a construction company. Yeah. And then, so my job every Monday morning after the race on the weekend was to make sure that car was ready for the next race on Friday night, at, whether it be at Bangor or Unity yeah. or wherever it was. Oh, you guys went everywhere for a right. while. Yeah. And uh, so my job was to make sure on Monday morning that car got fixed before we worked on any dump trucks. Yeah. <laughs> <You know>? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the racing business eliminates all other business. Well, yeah. and Priorities. Just a funny little tie-in. I used to drive trucks for area lumber companies a long time ago, 30 years yeah. ago. And yeah. I used to deliver material to Louis Construction. No way. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That so. was probably when he was building the houses yeah. and tops them. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Louis. Yeah. I always liked Louis. Yeah. So, uh, well, let's let's uh, jump next door here for just a second. This is the quietest I've ever seen you. But <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not in the car. No. Don't, <laughs> don't worry, so, Billy. 
um, I know a lot of the history, but fill in some of the folks who may not. Uh, you know, you come from another fam family of racing, not just your dad. Your mom raced. Yeah, uh, um, we actually, my mom, my dad, and myself are all champions at Wiscasset. Yeah. Um, she was a powder puff. I believe it was 74. She won the powder puff champion down there. And, of course, my dad was there and started in 1970, but he ran dirt cars up at Unity and all the fairgrounds all over oh. the state. Yeah. I mean, he would... Wherever there was a race, he'd put it in the back. He had a 56 Ford dump truck, and he'd put that car in the back of it and just travel to the fairgrounds and race. Yeah. When did Wiscasset open? 69. When did your father win the championship? He won two of them. He got one in 84 or oh, 5, Jesus. and the other one was in the 70s. Yeah, I thought he might have won one of the first ones. But yeah. Well, the 70s would have been close. But. Yeah, and I, I did uh, 2013, and yeah. I did one when it was uh, Superior Speedway. Yeah. It in actually the, closed down yeah. the year I won that. When did you start racing? I started, uh, let me see, I was 12, so that was 74. That was my first race. I jumped into it. The driver didn't show up. For, yeah. My dad had a uh, late model, and we had a charger car. Well, the guy who was supposed to show up for the charger car didn't get there. Well, Dad was out running the heat race. They called for the charger car to go to lineup. Well, I drove it down to lineup. The guy never showed up, so I put the helmet on, and out I went. <laughs> <laughs> when I got back in, when Dad was not happy. How yeah. did you do? Sixth. Yeah. How many cars? I uh, have 14. That's yeah. all right. No, that it, it, it was a four-door '64 Chevelle with a 236 cylinder in it. Three Family speed. car. Yep. Oh yeah, <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> and we were talking, you know, kind of bringing it back to what we always ask at the beginning of the show. We were talking off camera, and you kind of were at a crossroads as a young man. You you liked hockey, and all of a sudden you said something changed your mind. Well, when I was a little boy, when I went down to back then, we used to build models. For your favorite drivers because it was my dad the day i walked down there to give that trophy to my father onto that track that was like me walking onto daytona and i said i'm gonna race well years later i got playing hockey and i was real good at it and uh, the coach of the main mariners asked me to play for the team this was oh 70 seven eight nine and uh i looked at dad i said i'm 16. You know, I was playing with Guy Delpat, Wayne Schaub, Pete Peters, all those guys who yeah. I played hockey with. And uh, I told Dad, he said, if I play hockey, I can't race cars. And I said, I'm gonna race cars. <laughs> so this is all after you jumped in the car? Yeah. Because I would have thought finishing six and getting that taste of it, and your dad being a racer and winning races for decades, that would have been the moment you got the bug. It, well, what happened was in a race. Uh, we st Dad started a new business in Portland. The, we weren't the, racing. The bus line? Yeah, the bus company. Well, we started with a truck stop, and then we had the buses, but he'd given up racing for quite a while, and that's why I went into hockey, and I think he put me into hockey to keep me out of trouble. That's you know? hard to believe. And, and I'm pretty work. sure that's why, you know, <laughs> kept me caged on the ice pretty much. Yeah, yeah. And uh, <laughs> then I bought a Beechridge car and uh, went out there and... I think it was the second race I bought that out there on the clay, and I won with that, a 65 Chevelle. I loved that car, and uh, it was on from there. Yeah. Okay. That's a, you, you know, run back to your father. I can remember, I know people remember Ray mostly from going to Wiscasset later on. There's not a lot of people around to remember the early days, but I can remember at Unity, it was still dirt, and they'd just gone to overhead V8s, and Ray, shut down for a while. Yep. Maybe it was still a half mile track actually. Yeah. And Ray showed up after coming out of a semi retirement with flathead six or a flathead Ford and beat those overheads three in a row on a half mile track. Yeah. He won the governor's cup. That was pretty impressive really, back in those days. I actually have an article at Unity. He was in a wreck, got thrown out of the car onto the track, got back in the car and won the race. <laughs> Where was that at? Unity? Unity. Yeah. Crazy. I've I've actually got his Unity car. Yeah. You know, yeah. I just it it the ingenuity that you did that we all did back in the day, now they buy speed. Yeah. It's not made by no, your brain or anything. You go here. buy it, yeah. you bolt it on. If it goes fast, if it doesn't, you buy another piece. It's yeah. very computerized yeah. and 
Yeah. The ingenuity of the drivers and the mechanic skills that they had yeah. to build these cars yeah. and make them go. We came up with things in our own heads that, oh, well, try this, see if it works. And yeah. you could go get parts out of a junkyard. You, and, well, yeah. you wouldn't get a part, and then you modified yeah. it yeah. to whatever you thought it would work, yeah. you know? Yeah. Now, Ken, we're not going to let you off the hook either over there. I know you're sitting in for Bob Harrison today, so you can either tell us how Bob got started or you can tell us how you got started. Yeah, you need to tell us about your first years, Ralph Nason University. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, that's where my formal education began, no doubt first about team that. First worked for it. in high school. Yeah. But I grew up in a little town in Newburgh, and Ralph was one of its most famous residents at the time, and he'd been racing a couple of years, I think, and... Uh, in the spring of uh, 67, just before uh, school got out for the summer, Ralph had built a, a nice 56 Ford, and he bent the frame real bad. And uh, some friends uh, had been hanging around Ralph's little garage in Newburgh, and they, they encouraged me to go with him one day, and uh, Ralph needed to replace this race car. Uh, and uh, school had just gotten out for the summer. And Ralph was on the road selling winds friction proof and somewhere I in Rooster County. Ralph talking about that, yes. And uh, so uh, uh, a couple of Bobby Lindsay who worked for him and a, and a guy named Al Appleby worked on the car. Uh, while Ralph was in, in uh, Rooster County, my friends and I took all the parts off the existing race car and had found another 56 Ford that we tore everything out of. And uh, the adults would come in the evening and do the welding and that sort of thing. And during that week, while Ralph was in Arista County, we put together a race car. And uh, off to Unity we go. Of course, I had to sneak into the pit. I was only 15 years old, and they actually checked things like that. A lot of teenager like stories today. Yeah. <laughs> back then. But uh, he went out and uh, won the heat, won the semi-feature with the car that we just put together, and wrecked in the feature. Ralph had a nasty habit back then. He thought in a 35 lap race, he started at the rear, he ought to be leading the first four or five laps. But, uh, and that went on uh, working for Ralph's uh, uh, summers uh, and, until I was in college and got married in, in 1972. But uh, the racetrack was a great place to grow up. Yeah. Uh, somehow the, the, the adults at the, at the track, the drivers, and got, so many were like Dana Graves. Yeah. And Fuzzy Holden were open. A 15-year-old could walk up to them and yeah. talk to them. And they learned that I wanted to go to college. And the encouragement that I got from the racing community, yeah. wrapping their arms around me, uh, started school in the fall of 1969. And every article of clothing I wore in my first class was purchased by Ralph and Nancy. Wow. It is more to the story, though. That's right. And you, go ahead. <laughs> And Bob Knowles, God bless him, uh, gave me $100 and paid my entire first year tuition at what's now UMaine Prescott. Wow. Boy, it's, yeah. that's funny how the world gets smaller, isn't it? Yeah. People yeah. rally around each yeah. other. That's and a cool story. So I, I got married and went off to graduate school, eventually earned a PhD in mathematics. But uh, I was living in Florida, working at Cape Canaveral in 1998. And I opened the I would read the Bangor Daily News online, and Ralph won the Oxford 250. Yeah. I couldn't believe it. And then he won the Oxford 250. And then, and he, then won, he won, won the Oxford 250. <laughs> <laughs> so his fourth trip, I went down there, and he, he spun out twice and came in second. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, and then I began to be, be interested in, in, the, in the history of racing, and I can't get enough of it. Yeah, you yeah. come full circle. Yeah. 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 That's and, uh, good for us, good yeah. for you. <laughs> so, Pete. You you are yes. the the captain of the ship now. Go ahead and uh, responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't like I said when I met you, you were already full bore. I didn't realize at such a young age, eleven or twelve years old, you were working on stuff and building motors, flathead Fords, and on. I mean, oh, yeah? was it because the junkyard was there, or because your family was around cars? I mean, no, my father was a carpenter. <laughs> was that too clean for you to get into or something? <laughs> so my next door neighbor, which there was one house in between us, he one of, there was fifteen kids in the family, and the neighbor's family, the neighbor's family, and so two of the brothers who were still living at home, one was a little bit younger than me, and the other one was a little bit older. 
um, their older brother had come home from the service and he had this his own little junkyard up back on a hill and we'd go up there and it's hard to imagine how many 44s we cut up and took engines, took five engines apart and finally got enough to make one to ride around through the woods in these field bombers. Jitterbugs and yeah. stuff like that, yeah. yeah. And that's how we, I mean, so I'd spend my time doing that. My parents would be off to some world's fair or something and I'd stay home and I'd eat down to their house and uh, we'd go up back and all day long work on those cars. So uh, you so you were doing that. Did you, uh, what did you graduate to before then as far as car stuff before you r ran into Louie's daughter in that chapter started? Well, I, or did you know her back then already? No, no. And, uh, but I always had played around with, you know, as soon as I could, with antique cars. Yeah, okay. You know, so my first... I call it real antique car that I had was um, basically my father come home one night and says, you want to buy a Model A pickup? And I'm like, yeah, I guess. Why? Well, I, guy's got one. He says, you want to buy it or not? And I'm like, well, I guess. So he's like, well, I said, how much? And he's like, $50. And I'm like, $50? Can't be much of a truck. <laughs> so it was up in uh, almost on the New Hampshire border in Western Maine. So we go up there, well, what happened was a building had collapsed on it. So the snow was so deep, you were at the top of the roof, and we had to climb down in to see it. And the only damage it did, it put a little dent in the roof. Wow. The people didn't know that. Yeah. So <laughs> we finally, when the snow went down, we went up and got it and tow it at home. That's how good it was. And, Pretty uh, nice. Yeah, and then I you know, redid some of the stuff on it. And that was all downhill from there. <laughs> I had antique cars ever since, yeah. you know. Yeah. Well, I... I that was going to be another question. There's a lot here about your antique car right. career and stuff, and I didn't even know that was part of your life until I, guess, I think I talked to you on the phone a couple of years ago and you were doing some of that. Yeah. So you, 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 talked, you talked about getting the first car, the Fairlane, right. the Louis did. Right. Then you talked about buying Harvey's car. The Mustang. And Earl drove the Mustang, right? Yep. Yeah. And if you could ever find a picture of it, were Earl always came up with the saying, my word. So the first thing when we had it painted with his number and stuff on the front of the hood, my father-in-law had the guy doing the lettering put on my, my word. <laughs> well, there are pictures of that car out there. I don't yeah. know if yeah. I've seen that. Actually, I just saw yeah. that in yeah. 19. Yeah. 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 That's the Mustang. Sharp, sharp looking yeah. car. Yeah. 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 So, you know, I know you hauled Ralph to the two, to Martinsville well, before in the yeah. kit car. The dot, I think right. he had brake problems or yep. something. Yeah, I did. I think you've hauled Stan down there, or did Stan drive for you guys? Uh, you no, that was one time it was his car, and then I think the other time we took him down, I think it was our car. I think it was the, would it have been the Ventura? The that Pontiac? would, yes, because I was the there. Pontiac I remember when the bolts came out of the rear end when he put the brakes on. Remember right. the whole center of the rear right. end spun it's around? Fine. It was the Pontiac <laughs> okay. Ventura. Yeah. Yeah, that was in the 70s. Yeah. But that leads me to my next question. By now, these are Laughlin cars. Right. What, I know you guys had a long-standing relationship with Mike Laughlin. Right. As Lindy White did when I went to drive for Lindy. But right. What, brought, what got you there? Well, we... Not the guy in the 71 car. Well, uh, we actually had a car previous to that, which was a Ford Torino. I remember that car. And that yeah. was built by, and I can't think of the guy's name, it was in California. And it was... A, Famous car builder out there, but Baldwin? No, no, it wasn't. I can't. Stock car products name. guy, Tom Hamilton. Yeah, it might have been. Yeah. So, but then we switched to General Motors to because that was the last Ford we had, and switched to Chevys. And then somebody I don't recall who it was told us you should see go down and see Mike Laughlin. Well, of course, by now McCabe's running one of them, and somebody yes, lines and people Glines you probably and all knew. Those guys, yeah. yeah, and. Uh, so, of course, my father-in-law was like, this is going to be cold, hard cash, this deal. Oh, yeah. So, w everything, that's all it took for Mike Laughlin. We oh, became yeah. best of buddies. Yeah. <laughs> Same deal with Lindy White. I went down there to help build a car. Right. He owed Lindy at one time. Yeah. You know, Lind yeah, Mike was pretty good to work with yeah. like that. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so, we got to be real good friends with him and go down to his shop, and he set up our cup car. Got that all set up and the one Dick drove. Uh, yeah, uh, yes, I, th uh, I think you ran about 190, almost 200 miles an hour yeah, with it down there. Right, that yeah, was, was your car, wasn't it? Yeah, number then, 80. Yeah, I think so. And then uh, we had 
uh, Tony Glover's father, Gee, Gene Glover, drove for, you. Drive, drove for us in one of the Bush races. Didn't you? He do an end over end in your car at Charlotte? Mm, no, not that I know. Not that sure I remember. Of? I thought he drove. For, didn't you? Uh, Gene Glover was a driver at Charlotte one time, the three hundred. I, I can't. I don't think so. Okay. But I won't swear to that. I don't. But I don't remember ever coming home with a wrecked race car. You don't. You know, other than <laughs> other than wow. tangling up with you in the <laughs> unity. But <laughs> I was going to say, did he take it off the trailer? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, oh yeah, we had plenty of those, and we had our own jig at the shop. Yeah. Then I could put the chassis right on the jig and straighten it out or cut it or whatever I had to do. So, so the, the, the guy that built all the Buick V6s. Carl Wagner. How did you get tied up with him? Well, it's that's old, what you it's ran kind in of your a, cars, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Excuse me. It's kind of a long story, but to shorten it up, we were going to race at Daytona and Jim Ruggles. I don't know if you remember oh, yeah. him. All right. Yes. Well, we called Jim Ruggles and we said, we want two V6s. We want one assembled, ready to go. We want one in pieces. Yep, no problem. My, and my father-in-law said, this is a cash deal. We actually went down and talked to him, which is another whole deal. But anyway, um, so he says, well, they'll be ready for you after Daytona or at, you know, when you get done at Daytona. So my father-in-law would come in and say, did you talk to Ruggles? And I'm like, yeah, but they're not ready yet. They're not ready yet. Kept, that went on for a while. Finally, we go to Daytona and we, we call them, engines weren't ready. So now we get home and we're back and forth with Ruggles and he doesn't have the engines. So now my father-in-law made a phone call and found out that General Motors needed two test engines. So they bought the two engines that we were scheduled for us. Yeah. So now things didn't go well. He gets on the phone. One of the guys' name was Joe Negri. Yeah, he was name. one of the yeah. officials for the racing Buick division. Yeah. And so he gets on with him and this other guy, and he's like, how do you think your stockholders are going to feel when I start putting the word out of what you guys are spending on this racing and all this stuff? So Kyle Wagner gets a phone call from Buick. And they're, he, they're like, we don't know what you can do, but we need two engines fast, <laughs> real fast. So he says, well, what do you need those for? And he told them, this guy in Maine needs two Buicks. So, because that's when Ricky Craven was driving. Yeah. So he, uh, they uh, called Cal. So Cal Wagner had no clue who Louie was. So he calls uh, Bobby Dragon in New York. I mean, in Vermont, yeah. because he was doing Bobby Dragon's Motors. So Kyle calls him up, and he says, who is this Louie character in Maine? He says, what do you mean? He says, well, some guy in Maine, that General Motors just called me, and his name is Louie something. He couldn't remember what his last name was. And they need two engines in a hurry. He says, well, I can tell you one thing. If that guy wants two engines, you'd better get them done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so he did, and then same thing. Cash deal. Yeah, we got two engines, and from that point on, we were really good friends yeah. with Kyle. So, did you buy a new? Your relationship started him coming over and tuning those motors up for you. Uh, yeah, that's basically when Bob and I hooked up. I mean, we'd known each other, but yes, he was helping. Uh, we got our first Wagner engine. Was it new or was it a used it, motor? It was no. a used motor. You know, you Kyle gave us a deal on it, right. and uh, Kyle said. Don't ever take the valve covers off it. What do you mean? Only one person in Maine gets to look at what's inside my engines, and that's Mr. Bailey. So, so that in order for us yeah. to buy that yeah. engine, we had to guarantee. He said, if you, if anybody else looks at that motor, he'll never sell me another piece. And the only one that looked into my Wagner engines was Bob. Yeah. So that worked out good. I mean, some you your yeah. business, and you had a motor man. On, oh yeah, on, on on site basically. Yeah, and Kyle, yeah. he was. He's a big old farm boy, the nicest man you could meet. Oh, yeah. I mean, he yeah. was such, I drove out there the year that they had the big snowstorm in Buffalo and everything got buried. I drove a 72 Chevy van out there with my engine in the back to go wow. get it rebuilt. Well, I'd left Buffalo the morning that it snowed so bad. Had no heat in the van, I was freezing to death, me and my wife at the time. 
and uh, get out there and we flew home. He showed me all, I mean, you couldn't ask for a nicer person, just a great guy. People have always said a lot of nice things about him. Yep. No and, heat, middle of a yeah. storm, what you do to race. Exactly, well, exactly. Uh, one of the stories with Carl is we were running down to Lime Rock and Carl happened to come when we qualified outside pole and we were running real good. And, uh, I'd learned a, a new secret into the road race. I started shifting in the middle of the corners. So anyway, we, Cal Wagner come over and I was talking with Bob Harrison, my crew chief. And he was talking about the car, how good it was. We were all really excited. And I looked, watched Cal, he leans in the car like that. And I went, Bob, I forgot to erase the tack. He went, <laughs> what's that mean? I said, oh, we're gonna be in trouble. <laughs> so Cal reaches in, he flips it up. And I mean, he moved like an old farm boy. Yeah. Clicked it back, he come walking over. Boy's gonna have to change gear in that car. <laughs> Why? 9,200, she's not gonna take that all day long. So right. we said, okay. Bob, I said, we'll change it. And Bob Harris, he said, what are we gonna do? I, Cal, and, I said, don't you touch that car. Yeah. It's flying. <laughs> right. Speaking of those Buick V6 and RPMs, do you remember renting us a motor to go to Martinsville with? Oh yeah. Well, just as a side note, this is a Dick McCabe story. Dick McCabe, you know how thrifty he is. Carl Wagner, when he came out here with his motorhome, he would park it at our shop. And then we would go to either Loudoun or Oxford, wherever the big race was. So he was doing some V6s for Dick. So we get up to the racetrack at Oxford, and he comes in, and, and Dick starts crabbing about the valve cover leaking. So... Carl looked at him, he says, well, what's the problem? He says, well, I put it in and tighten it down and this thing leaks. So he's standing there and he's, you got a valve cover gasket? Yeah, I got one right over here. Goes and gets it, puts it on the back of the trailer. Carl says, you got a hammer? Yeah, I got a hammer right here. Gives Carl a hammer and he smashes the gasket. So that's what happens when you over tighten it and walked <laughs> off. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it, it, when I started to say, you leased that motor, it was a McCabe motor, it had 200 lap races on it, nobody right. goes to Martinsville with a used motor. Right. We had the Grand Dam, it was the only 112 inch car in the start, in, in the pit area. Rusty Wallace was in the race, all the big dogs with 105 inch cars. We had that motor of yours. And I, it got me on this story as RPMs, now you said, Pete, don't turn it too hard. <laughs> Yeah, Pete Silver they took 15, RPMs. They took 15 <laughs> cars the first day, and that big old boat made it the first day, 13th. And we ran third the whole race, but we turned it a little over 8,800. <laughs> 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 and it shook the oil pan off it, yeah. or loosened it up, and it started smoking. NASCAR, out of respect, just said, bring it to the inside and run the last 10 laps, and we still finished in the top 10. But right. I was impressed with that motor. I mean, you go down there with a used motor, run against that kind of competition that's a testament to you and right. you guys what you could do yeah. yeah bill i was going to have you kind of jump into the timeline of your career it obviously started at wiscasset but you've run pretty much every track every series you can get your hands on yes, so I, yeah there's quite a timeline there that some people may not realize most uh, do but we i started basically uh late 70s was really my start full-time driving uh i've gone to Spud Speedway, you know, uh, to Dover, all the way to Ohio. I've run everything in between, all kinds of different tracks, and uh, I've, I've really enjoyed doing it. You made it. a quick leap, though, up into the upper classes, up into late model sportsmen and stuff. You didn't spend too much time down in the... No, uh, and that came, my dad made the bet, and it was his fault. He said, you want to race out at Beechridge? He says, we'll go pro stock racing. So probably a month went by. Begin the week, I said, go to Beatrice, I'm going to win this weekend. He's like, you ain't going to win, you fat-headed. I said, I don't even have to show up, I'm going to win. I said, I will win that race. Long story short, three laps to go, I ended up getting spun, put to the rear, 17 cars, and I won the race. I ground the rear quarter right off on the wall, I never lifted. And uh, Dad said that day, it probably cost him $6 million. Yeah, you know, but I Home mean, yeah, <laughs> the relationship that it built between me and my dad, yeah, uh, we wouldn't have traded it for the world. You yeah. know, we, we went through pro stocks to Bush North. Um, you know, not a lot of racers get to do that. Yeah, 
No, it's true, especially with their fathers. Yep. And, you know, it's... Down in Wisconsin, we had, when uh, Dave St. Clair had it, I believe it was 92. So Dad had bought the 12X car that nobody could beat. Yeah, the Kemper well, car, right? Boy, yeah, yeah. yeah. and uh, Dad started in front of me for the feature. Well, we come out of turn four and they dropped the green flag. Well, you know, I'm about an inch off his bumper, you know. He missed, nobody knew this, he missed a shift and I packed him right into the wall, right? <laughs> So he goes in the pit and he comes on the radio and he says, you better win this race. He says, you've got a lot of damage to pay for. I won that race by half a track. Yeah. So the following night I go to Unity, Saturday night, and uh, people are up there, Juice, did you wreck your father? And everybody's coming around and I said, yeah, and I like him. Don't get in my way. <laughs> <laughs> Honest to God, everybody pulled me inside, just let me yeah. go. Yeah. Uh, to, to stick in 92, and, and I don't want to bring this too much of a downer, but 92 was a, an eventful season. And I take you back 20, uh, I'm sorry, 32 years, almost to, to now when we're taping. You lost one of your best friends, Bruce Kane, yeah, yeah, racing yeah. head to head with yeah, him. Uh, yeah, actually, I won that night, yeah. and uh, it was amazing. Uh, you know, Bruce was running in the back, but I heard the hit inside my car, and I was on the back stretch. You know, because we, we'd crossed the finish line, and I heard the hit. Didn't know who it was, but I was like, that was bad, and pulled around and saw Bruce, and I mean, I pretty much the, the rock was into his seat. That's how far yeah, in that it went stuck in. on crossing uh, the No, nah, it yeah. didn't stuck. He, he, he actually, I've got the tape of that race. Yeah. He lost control. He was trying to gather it back, and he was still on and off the throttle trying mm -hmm. to, but he had dipped over, you know, was cast and had that front yeah. lip. Yep. He dipped over that, and, and he didn't get it back up over there. You've only got a little bit of time, yep. and then you're going to go off the top of, of one. And he was just trying to keep control of it the whole way. He yep. drove it until it hit. Yeah. You know? mm. And then I won the two memorial races after that. Right. Yep. He was a diehard. I spent a little, I've come home to visit. I went to help Ralph one night, and Ronnie and Bruce. Yeah, I mean he was racing at Wiscasset. Yeah, yeah, I raced Good against guy. him at Bangor. He was a diehard. Yeah, I mean he yeah. he was a just like the rest. We were race car drivers. Yeah, build them work all night yeah. long. You know, you wrecked your car on Friday night. You got to go race on Saturday. You worked. Yeah. How about wrecked in ten consecutive events? What's that about? What's that? How many? There's a deal <laughs> here. You ninety nine. You wrecked in ten second consecutive events. I think that was in the bush car. Yeah. No. Yeah, the yeah, bush car. Yeah. Yeah. The bush car the hell yeah. was that? I got tied up in so much all the time. It happened right in front of me. Yeah. You know, and, and you know, when you're racing star in a 3,200-pound car, yeah. it's not going to move far. Not a lot of room. And, uh, you know, we were running hard. We are trying to build our name. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I was involved in a lot, but didn't bang up a lot of stuff, you know bending a fender or something yeah. like that, but we finished the races. Yeah, well, that's good. You know, yeah. um, and I was aggressive. You know, I wanted to win races. So, so where'd, you, where'd you come up with the number zero? I mean, your father had three for a while. And yeah, he 80. had 83. Um, actually, it, it, I showed up at the racetrack with no number on the car. It was easy to put tape on zero. <laughs> and, <laughs> really? And yeah. That was, yeah. that was okay. the honest God's truth. Yeah, I didn't have a number on the car, and, it's pretty easy to make zero. Where'd you guys get your number, the number nine? We usually ask that at the beginning. Yeah. Where did you come up with the number nine? Well, I hate to say this, but we had obviously Earl Jones's, which was 19. 19. Well, things weren't going well, so we decided that's when we hired Harvey. Yeah. Or, or had to drive, I won't necessarily say hired. And the easiest thing to do was take the number one off. Yeah. Okay. So 19 became the... So that worked good. Everybody recognizes it no matter where you go. Yeah. 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 So, you know, it was just a matter of, it's easy to switch to a number nine. Yeah. That's how we came up with that. So, so, so and it wasn't that we were upset with Earl or anything, mm -hmm. but we just figured, you know, things just weren't going that great. So we figured we'd try Harvey and he wanted to drive so and it costs just as much to lose it that's to win yeah. so let's go do it <laughs> right so know. where did where did I'm sorry to no, jump no, in no, on no. you but where did Bob Harrison kind of jump into the picture that's with, a good question uh, yeah. I was running the bush tour and uh, I was doing the cars myself setting them up and doing all that 
And uh, Bob Harrison and my dad started talking and uh, basically uh, we needed a crew chief and dad said, you want to work with us? And he said, yes. And that's how it started. If it wasn't for Bob, I, I can honestly say this, this is a credit to Bob Harrison. I had two really bad wrecks and if it wasn't the way he built those cars, I'd be dead. Well, you lucked out because if it wasn't going to be Bob, it was almost me. You must remember that. <laughs> no, really. Well, really. Yeah, I wasn't racing at the time. Yeah. You know, I was still here, and uh, I was in a lot of talks with Ray. We were going to do it. And then I got a chance to go back. That was another few minutes with Ray that wasn't fun, too, by the way. <laughs> yeah, he, he was pretty hot-headed. Yeah. But yeah, Bob... Like I said, I knew you guys, but I didn't know much about Bobby Harrison. And, Actually, uh, Bob pretty... was racing the dirt when yeah. I won my first race. He was running late models back then. Mm -hmm. He was running the Bandit, yeah. you know, the Trans Am. Yeah. His car was beautiful. Yeah. The workmanship that man can do is unbelievable. You know, and like I said, he always made sure if, that my cars were safe. Yeah, he's a real deal. Yeah, without a doubt. He and he he has a craft that yeah. not many people have. Mm -hmm. yeah, he's a very happy going guy too. Easy yeah. to talk to. I think he's got a lot of people. And, and that was what was real strange. You got Bob Harrison, who's kind of calm and laid back, and then you got me. <laughs> you know. And then you got Ray. Right. Right. And so it was funny. Like we'd race the road courses. So my thing on the radio because. They wouldn't just, I knew who was in what corner, so I knew where the act, what was going on. We'd put dad over in the far back, you know, nothing's gonna ever happen over there, right? And Bob was, of course, he's on the crew chief. And uh, I remember I'm going by Bob, and dad goes, There's an accident. Or he says, Wrecked. I said, Dad, I went through there a minute ago. <laughs> <You know? Yeah. laughs> but I, the, the fun that we had, the road racing for us, uh, we felt we had a fair shake at because we didn't, uh, you know, we were down in points. So if you showed up at the circle track, they pecked your car as you were in points. So Kelly and everybody that's in the top 15. Didn't get much practice, huh? Yeah, yeah I'd go out and i get one practice. Well, yeah. how am I going to make get any better if I can't get any practice to make the cows go? Yeah. But on the road course, it was, it was a driver. Yeah. You know, was, the equipment did help, but a driver could make up big, big change. Right. Yeah, you're up north, so there's not a lot of uh, ringers coming in, as they say. You know what, you guys are all learning, rogue, other than a couple guys, you're all learning at the same time. Right. Kind of puts you on equal footing, I think, a little bit. Well, like Brad and Andy, and most of them went to road race school. Yeah. Well, I didn't have money to do that. And uh, the day we qualified outside pole down to Lime Rock, one of the people come up and they said, uh, How'd you get good at road racing? And I said, you want to know the truth, like, honest truth. I said, when I was a little boy, my dad was a truck driver, so he'd leave on Monday. Well, Monday night, I fired up the field bomber and out I'd go on the road. Yeah. And I knew if the cops caught me, dad was going to be mad. Right. So they never caught me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Old, school, old, school, old school learning, yeah. that's right. Go going back to Beach Ridge, boy, <laughs> you had a lot of history there uh, with champions, didn't you, at Beach Ridge? You talking to me? <laughs> <laughs> Those glasses work at all. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you, you did Bob Bellado? Yeah. Multiple championships. Uh, how many? Bobby Randall. Bobby Randall. You won four with Randall. You won three with Bob. Uh, Donnie. Did my editors. My editors. Donnie Colbert. Wow. Yeah. Donnie yeah. Colbert. Yeah. Yeah. You are famous. Well, it's, it started with Bobby Randall. And I, I actually, see that. I went to school with him for a couple of years over to SMVTI in South Portland. So I didn't really know him other than him being in my class. And so I went to Beach Ridge one night with a friend of mine who was actually, he lives in Brunswick, but he was one of his sponsors. Because Malcolm Grafham was, his, his wife, Malcolm's wife was a cousin to this guy who went to Beach Ridge. So we get there, so he loses a motor. So this, he didn't have any money to buy another motor, so this friend of mine says, you ought to build him a motor. Were you already in the motor business? Yeah. Okay. So I said, well, I've never built one for Beach Ridge, you know. So long story short, I built the motor, which I owned. It wasn't his, I owned yeah. it. So the next week, they put it in the car, and 
because he's got a whole big crew and they're all standing down by the fence and I'm up on the hill and he's out there practicing and they turn around and look, looked at me like I had three eyeballs, you know. I'm like, geez, it can't be that bad. So they come in and I go down and, and he pulls his net down and he says, are you sure this thing is legal? <laughs> <And I'm> like, <laughs> Fastest he's ever been? I said, yeah. I said, I built it by, you know, the Beatridge yeah. rules. So then from there on, I mean, he won a lot of races. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. You're talking about Randall? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Bobby had he had a streak there. He won all the big all the big races. Yeah, really. yeah, yeah. So, fast forward a little bit. One night, and I won't mention the guy's name, but they decided to tech his car. Well, it had the Ford lifters in it, and the reason it had Ford lifters, lifters was the fact that it was the block I used was one of our bush blocks. Yeah, and that was the only one I had that was any good, so I built it out of that. Well, the cam I used was the same cam that would have been in regular lifters or whatever, so it didn't really amount to anything. Really? Yeah. So no, it didn't really. <laughs> Ford I, lifters over a Chevy lifter? Yeah, but see, the cam, the okay. design of the cam All was right. the same. So anyway, big meeting, right? Well, we're gonna have a meeting about this, and they wanted to disqualify him. So I get a phone call from Ralph Cusack, and he's like, "Jay's," he says, "We don't want to lose him." I, he says, what would it take to change that back? And I said, geez, Ralph, I, I don't have time. I can't change it back. So he says, geez, he says, we got to do something because <coughs> we don't, he brought a lot of people. Yeah, it's a good attitude for the guy to have rather right. than just yeah, blow it right. up. I like that. So yeah. anyway, it, it went on. I get a phone call from Bob Libby. He's like, is there any way you can do this? We will pay you to change that back to get him back at the track. That's how yeah. bad they wanted him. And I said, Bob, I can't. I don't have time. So now they had this big meeting. Ralph calls me on the phone. And my During father, the meeting? No, this was, this was a, a, a day or two later after the Tuesday meeting when we went over there. And of course, my father-in-law was there. I get a phone call from Ralph, and I'm talking. And my father-in-law walked in. So who are you talking to? Talking to Ralph. Well, of course, he knew Ralph for years. So he said, give me the phone. So he's talking to Ralph, and Ralph says, well, geez, he says, you know, I have to, that was when they had, what is it, the MSCCRA? M MV, uh, yeah. Whatever it was. Yeah, yeah. SS, yeah. Yeah. Right. So Main State Stock Car Racing Association. Yeah. 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 yeah, right. So <laughs> Ralph says, well, you know, they kind of run the thing, and I have to, you know, deal with that and all that. So, I'm, I mean, I can hear him to this day. He says, my father-in-law says, Ralph, he says, if that was Bob Bayer, he might be standing on the corner all by himself, but he wouldn't be listening to anybody. That's all it took. I get a phone call the next day from Ralph. You can have all the big lift as you want. He's not DQ'd, and you can put the engine back in. And that was history. So that was a new rule. And, then, and that's when the MSCCRA dissolved. That was over that whole deal over the lifters. No way. Yep. That's how that all came about. Yeah, because because Ralph now changed made the, rules the decisions. The yeah. Right, Ralph made the decisions now, and that was the end of the MSCCRA. Hmm. Well, that yeah. place was around. That was around for a while, wasn't it? Oh yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 yeah, Some pretty good people leading that deal for a while, yeah. I think. So, yeah, you we, know, we won the. Uh, Red, did Randall stop? Uh, he stopped right after the crash at Wiscasset, didn't he? Uh, must have been right in that area. Yeah, he yeah. took a real bad, bad hit. Here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. really bad yeah. on the front stretch. Yeah. 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 You fed a couple there yourself. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. This doesn't seem to affect you. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I've had some bad crashes, but you know. But I, I always equate your driving style to the same as Dave St. Clair. Yeah. Let them know you were there. You know, I, checkers are wreckers in some people's books. You, uh, I wasn't. Everyone knows when the pink zero was there. Exactly. And the best part is when they looked in the mirror and saw it coming, they knew it was going to go by one yeah. way or the other. Right. Well, I think, you know, you didn't, I was around you a lot. I didn't have any problem with you, but we raced like that. And I think people, you race people like you get raced, yeah. I think. And of course, some of us probably were a little more aggressive than others, and it took less to do those things. But I don't think you, 
Yeah, mostly I mean, you, started you only, out to go after somebody. No, yeah, yeah, I, I never went, no, I can honestly say I never went to a racetrack ever to say I'm going to get somebody back. Yeah. If I could get you that when it happened, that's yeah. one part. Right. You know, if I couldn't get you on the racetrack, the pit's yeah. pretty wide open. <laughs> I'll find you, you know. But I, I liked, you know, a little bit of rubbing on the doors. and That was good racing, you know. Yeah. Uh, Junior Hanley raced down there at Beechridge. I mean, I ran side by side with him for I don't know how long. That was fun racing, you know, the main state championship races and all. Yeah. It was a different group when you got it. It was weird because you'd get away from your Saturday night guys and you'd start running with the tour guys and the Saturday night guys would start driving like the tour guys. Yeah. So they, they had the ability to do it. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> I wanted to throw a question at Bob that I have been meaning to ask. Um, I, 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 I'm always hesitant to ask an engine builder this, but what are your thoughts about crate motors these days? <laughs> this is the age of the crate motor. Well, I mean, in my case, I do so many different engines yeah. that I'm not a fan of them by any mm -hmm. means, but if somebody brings one to me, I don't care. It's another block with pistons and rods. And yeah. <coughs> but like you said, I mean, the Ford motor was pretty much a race motor compared to the Chevy crate right. motor. Right. But I'm talking the early days before it was even around here. Those things weren't refined at all, those Chevy motors, no. the workmanship in them. It was, no, they're Were they like a boat motor or something designed originally? No, no, they designed them for racing, but, but they just were, their machine work and everything in them is terrible. Yeah, I, I, and they're not cost effective anymore. Hours. No, they're not. Not yeah. by the time. Now you can build a, a built engine, right. have better parts in it, less likely of blowing up, turn yeah. it harder. So the the affordability of a crate engine when it started was a good idea, right. but now that's gone. It's turned around probably what right. the last eight years. It was maybe. too hard to police yeah. it. You just people couldn't police it. You know? You're better off to go right. put in an engine. Those tires are only going to go so fast. Right. But crate motors, as much as the custom motor was when it first came out. Yeah. Right. I mean, but I, they were designed to be an affordable option, yeah. but now they're not. Yeah. I mean, you're spending on a crate engine 15, 16 grand, and you can get an engine built for that. And yeah. I mean, and better pieces. Better pieces <laughs> and more power. Yeah. yeah. But the, the, the yeah, big thing is, is that. Why have a have it locked to a crate engine? Yeah. Open it up and go, okay. But you've got some of these places, and I think Oxford might be one. I mean, this, how many, like the past series, how many motor rules are there? Oh, my oh, God. I mean, that's long list. I don't yeah. mean to be rude. Everybody needs a place to be or a chance to race, but that's crazy. Yeah. Right. Back, back in our day, here was the rules. Abide by them. Yeah. yeah. That's it. Yeah, you could go to multiple tracks right. without chasing anything. I can remember there, we'd go to Bangor on a Wednesday night, Wiscass at Friday, Unity Saturday. All yeah. in the same car, Uni same Unity. motor. Yes. Yeah. And if there was, the only thing that changed anything anyway is if you went to a Getty Open or Oxford, it might be a weight deal. If you yeah, had right. something a little different. Right. Than or a carburetor. Yeah, yeah, you might have to carry a little extra yeah. weight. I remember yeah. running. Uh, quick and I, go, huh? <laughs> I remember running uh, Wiscass on a Friday night, getting third. Oxford Saturday getting second, going down to Beechridge, and winning. Yeah, all yeah. with the same guy, and all they did was yeah. change tires. Yeah, That's when racing was, ver you could go everywhere. Yeah. Now it's like, oh, you, you have to race here, you have to race there, <laughs> you know? You yeah, know, we, Pete, we overshot the runway again. Yeah, well, these guys wouldn't stop talking. We tried <laughs> well, to stop them, but. Well, I will, I, I will say one thing, and I, I don't know how many people are in this situation, but my wife loves race cars, she likes antique cars, she likes whether it be NHRA drag cars, Wow! likes motorcycles, we ride a motorcycle all the time. You still ride vintage motorcycles, don't you? No, no, I have my very first motorcycle yeah. I ever had, but, but I, you know, I mean, I even have a rice rocket, you yeah. know, but she likes to ride on them all. So, you know, we see each other about two and a half hours a day, you know, <laughs> but she likes all the racing, period. You know, I mean, sometimes she's like, well, we, you know, we got to go to Oxford Sunday because Sounds it's like a pass race. Oh, Jesus, <laughs> yes. So. Yeah, she's That's got a lot of history awesome. with racing, though, with you and Louie. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I remember mom she's, and dad pick, making picnics down there at Wiscasset before they had, the uh, bathroom was down there by the four turn, yeah. that hill. And I remember mom putting out the blanket oh, and yeah. we'd actually eat, eat lunch and supper there. I yeah. remember people sitting on that hill. Yeah. 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 Well, we went, we took, I might have been when we took Stan Meserve to Martinsville. 
What we didn't know was my wife and her mother went to Martinsville and sat in the stands and watched the whole thing, and we didn't even know they were there. <laughs> <laughs> didn't, want to, didn't want anybody to know they knew you guys? Evidently, <laughs> I don't know. But they went to Martinsville themselves, and we didn't know until we got back that they were actually in the stands watching this. Yeah. Well, as usual, these shows could go on and on, and, yeah. and as usual, Pete and I overshot the runway, and the screen is gr is uh, bright red now. But um, we do like to close up the show the way we do every time, and just give you guys a chance to say thank you to anybody out there that's gotten you through your career and and you know brought you to this point. I know there's got to be some special. I know you're probably there. thinking me, but you can say somebody <laughs> else. <laughs> <laughs> well, the problem is I don't want to give any particular names because I've done so many engines for so many different people. I don't want to slight somebody, yeah. you know. I mean, I've done, I, it, it, there's probably not many people you can't name that I've done an engine for, well, yeah. including Pete. Yeah. <laughs> From the story you just told, I think you'd be thinking your wife and her father. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Well, I don't know if that's good or bad, yeah. but that's how it all started. Yeah. You know? yeah. Billy, how about you? God, over the years, all the people that helped me, you know, in the pits, uh, my boys, you know, for two boys to travel racing and be a pit crew, that, that was awesome. Michael and Dutch and, uh, you know, my dad. Obviously. You know, yeah. I mean, if it wasn't for him, I probably wouldn't have been racing, you know. Yeah. Um, got Pete, you know, you know, I watched him in the stands. He is older than me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I meant to ask you, I mean, to, to add on here, but how special was it for you to give your dad his final ride around Wiscasset and, and to, to see him put in the Wiscasset Hall of Fame. Uh, to give him that ride about broke my heart. But yeah. He gave me my first ride there. Right. And I mean, it chokes me up now, yep. you know, but uh, Good. it was, uh, that's where it all started for me and him. Yep. And our relationship was so good because of racing. Yep. And it all started at Wiscasset. You know, my mom, my dad, me, yeah. even my two sisters were winners there. Yeah. You know, so our whole family has won races yeah. at Wiscasset Raceway. Glad you got that opportunity. Yeah. Ken, you didn't get to talk much, and I know you jumped in at the last <laughs> minute, but thank you. Thank you for everything you do for us yeah. as an organization. We couldn't do it without like you. Like I said, we couldn't so do the you. show without all your help. Thank you very much. It, it's it's a privilege to, to work with you, and I really appreciate the time. And and our intention is on a future show to to get you and and Paige Pat Woods Pellerin, and Pellerin. Steve Pellerin together, just a group of historians, and really dig into the meat of just the history of this sport here in the state. And I want to make sure you're part of that. Thank you. Yeah. So um, thank you, Pete. Yeah, thank you. Good to see you uh, after yes, all this time. Uh, what do we have in store for future shows? I know. Well, we, we we were tossing it around on the way down. Obviously, we still got the Alexanders. Uh, we, and we've got to check this week. We still want to do Ralph Nason and Bobby. I can't remember Bobby's Bobby last. Bobby Lindsay. Bob Lindsay was the main man on the kit car, and obviously Ronnie Nason was the main mm -hmm. man when they won the three two fifties. Ronnie's had a liver transplant, and he's doing pretty well. So we need to see. Ken's going in for a major operation at the end of May, so we need to come up with the next one pretty quick so you yep. can have time. And uh, we also talked about it would eliminate him for this show, of doing a quick historian show with mm -hmm. uh, if Steve and Paige and maybe Charlie Sheehan. Yeah. You'd be all right with that one. Yeah, so we absolutely. might, if, you know, I know Ken would like to join us again, but it would be easier for him to make that show before his operation. Yeah. So yeah. maybe I'll call, in the next couple of days, call Steve and uh, Paige and, See if uh, Charlie can get a day off and do that. That might be interesting. They'd have their own information, actually. Yep. You know? <laughs> so that's thank kind of guys. what this yeah, whole show you. is about. Thank you guys for joining us, and thank you guys for watching, as always. Um, on behalf of Lincoln County TV, Pete Silva, mm -hmm. and all of us at the Maine Vintage Race Car Association, thank you for tuning in for another edition of the Vintage Racers Roundtable. This is all about supporting the history of the uh, motorsports in the state of Maine. And you can do that by supporting the Maine Vintage Race Car Association at mainevintagerace.org. You want to find out any information, go there. It helps us preserve the history and store the artifacts. It helps us maintain the mobile museum. It helps us put on the Maine Motorsports Hall of Fame banquet each year. So uh, this, and this is kind of a culmination of all the stuff that we do with the club. So uh, one final time on behalf of myself, Ken Minot, Pete Silva, and all the crew right here with us today. Thank you for joining us and we'll see you next time.